Okay, welcome everyone to the first of the webinars of Unfold Zero. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us uh, in this webinar. My name is Alan Ware. I'm one of the co-founders of Unfold Zero and the global coordinator of parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, I'm also standing in today for Heather, who uh, was the, the person who uh, organised the webinar and is also the person who came up with the idea of one of the, uh, the social media actions that we're doing on nuclear disarmament and the Open Air Working Group. Uh, but unfortunately she had a little technical problem and so is just listening in on the call today. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the Open End Working Group, which uh, is meeting in Geneva over the course of this year uh, to uh, deliberate on nuclear risk reduction measures and on legal measures and norms that will help achieve a nuclear weapons free world. Before we get into the topics, uh, the initial presentations on this, I just want to explain a little bit about the webinar. Uh, for us, this is quite new and for some of you it might be quite new as well. Uh, the webinar is a little bit like a, a, uh, a seminar or a panel in a room where you have speakers giving presentations, they'll send the opportunity to ask questions and to make comments, uh, but instead of all being in one room, we're in a virtual room. But it's got many of those functions. So you'll see on the right hand side of your screen that there will be um, a number of functions there. Now, one of those is questions. And here is where you can type a question in at any stage during the webinar, uh, during the time that one of us is speaking. We will, the, uh, the uh, organisers can see the questions and then we can alert you know, or provide time to actually have those questions addressed. There will also be um, hand, uh, hand, putting up your hand, there's a little button there. Um, what that means is that you would like to speak and so we will have a list of people that will be wanting to speak either to ask their questions or to give another comment. Uh, so we can see that, um, pay attention to it and then at a suitable time we can do that. Um, I think those are the, the key functions. At the moment, uh, the, your uh, microphones are, are muted. Uh, that's in order that there's clear sound for us as speakers at the beginning. But if we're going to then ask you to, uh, to uh, speak about your question or comment, we can unmute you so that you can ask that question. Okay, um, about to start. So, just a brief introduction to Unfold Zero. Uh, Unfold Zero comes from UN, United Nations, uh, Fold, Create, Zero, Nuclear Weapons. So, the idea is uh, focusing on initiatives at the United Nations uh, that will help to create a nuclear weapons free world. And there's a whole range of those initiatives and forums uh, within the, the UN system. Today we're focusing very much on the open-ended working group which has been established by the United Nations General Assembly in order to undertake substantive work on legal norms and measures to achieve and sustain a nuclear weapons free world and also to look at nuclear risk reduction measures, transparency and greater appreciation of the humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. It's quite a broad mandate. It's a deliberating mandate, not a negotiating mandate, but hopefully out of the deliber deliberations will come initiatives that might help then negotiations for various measures or agreements. Um, what To start off with, what, I, what I'd like to do is just quote Charles Dickens as a sort of a, a philosophical concept of something that seems quite small, a deliberation process in the UN, which hopefully might unlock uh, greater possibilities. Uh, and he once said, a very little key can open a very heavy door. And that's what we hope the open-ended working group might be, a key to open a door of negotiations for a nuclear weapons free world. 
I'm now going to uh, pass over to Mark Fineau, who's from the Geneva Centre for Security Policy and also from the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, uh, who is an expert on security issues and on nuclear disarmament, uh, to give some idea of what type of discussions are happening in the open-ended working group, uh, who's participating, and what types of outcomes we might expect. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alain, and uh, welcome to you all. Um, well, it's very difficult to say exactly what can be expected from the discussions. The first uh, important thing is obviously that they've been held, and this is not the first time. Uh, this is the second time that this working group has been meeting, and the first time was in uh, 2013. And there was already some substantial discussion already at that time. In the meantime, uh, of course, as we know, there has been the NPT review conference and uh, its uh, its failure, and uh, and of course the momentum started uh, in Oslo with the uh, conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons has has not uh, diminished on the contrary, and um, this explains why there is so much interest in this work, and. And, and of course, another reason why it is important is that uh, it is open to uh, civil society organizations and uh, research institutions, uh, academia, etc. So it's, it is a new approach. Uh, obviously, um, as it happened before, there is one major flaw in this process, is the absence of the nuclear weapon states, the nuclear armed states. Some think it's a good thing because then it's it's easier to to discuss the uh, this issue. Uh, others believe that it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a negative aspect of, of this process. But in any case, uh, it was the choice of those countries not to participate because obviously, as it. Uh, uh, as it is called, it's an open-ended group. That means it was op obviously open to all states. So they chose not not to to take part in this dialogue. And some could say that uh, maybe it's a sign that they don't feel comfortable. They don't. They're not comfortable enough to to um, explain and and argue in favor of their approach. So the, the main uh, aspects that were discussed, of course, consistent with the mandate, uh, basically can, can be uh, summarized in, in two um, categories. And this is uh, reflected in the chair's synthesis paper. The first group of questions regarded uh, the so-called concrete effective legal measures that need to be concluded to attain and maintain a world without nuclear weapons. And in this framework, there were a number of uh, ideas and, and projects, uh, proposals that were discussed, like the nuclear weapons ban or the nuclear weapons convention uh, and other legal instruments. And uh, the second category was a sort of catalog of potential measures that could be added or uh, comp that could complement the, the uh, main legal frameworks regarding transparency, reduction of risk of uh, unauthorized use, uh, uh, education, uh, awareness on the risk of uh, uh, nuclear detonations, uh, etc. So these are the, the two categories. Obviously, uh, no one can expect uh, a sort of spectacular, miraculous uh, agreement, consensus on all these issues. There, there's been uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of arguments, pro and con, uh, all of these measures. Um, now, uh, obviously, there will be an attempt by the chair to summarize, to synthesize uh, all this discussion and the report will be sent to the General Assembly and the General Assembly will have to decide what to do with it uh, on the follow-up or a call for a negotiation. Uh, these are, of course, uh, completely open uh, at the moment. But 
if you want my uh, personal opinion on the, the key questions that were asked, basically it boils down to two different approaches. Um, and I don't like to call them comprehensive or progressive or step by step because uh, you know every 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 name or every tag has its advantages and disadvantages. But basically, it boils down to asking the nuclear weapon states, the nuclear armed states, are you ready to enshrine into a document legally binding, preferably? the commitment that you already took in favor of the elimination of nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, basically this, this is the key question. If, if this, those uh, nuclear armed states say, no, we prefer the status quo, we prefer to maintain our current position, well, the rest of the international community may decide what to do with this uh, situation. So this is my summary. Thank you very much, Mark. And just before I pass over to Alex for her uh, introduction, uh, beginning comments, just a couple of other things to let participants know. Uh, firstly, there is also a slide that says handouts, and you'll see we have a few handouts there. Um, a couple that will be relevant to what Mark was talking about is firstly the program for the plenary sessions at the Open Ended Working Group. Uh, there you can see the topics that are like the general themes of what will be discussed uh, over the different uh, questions and issues that the Open End Working Group is, is mandated to look at. Secondly, and this is a longer paper, that's the chair synthesis paper. This is what Mark was talking about. The synthesis paper has arisen out of the February sessions of the Open End Working Group where there was a lot of discussion, where there were working papers put forward and the chair has tried to pull them together, as Mark mentioned, in a way of uh, providing some structure for the ideas and the proposals. Uh, so that's something which is also available on the Open End Working Group website and on Unfold Zero website, but you've got it here if you wish to refer to it during the course of the webinar. There are a couple of others, but they will come up um, when Alex is speaking because she's going to be talking about a, a couple of the other points. Um, and one other thing to mention also is that we've also got a couple of polls which we'll take during the course of the webinar. What that is is just a simple question to get some of your feedback um, and we'll be doing that uh, either between or during the speakers. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more uh, information about that after Alex has spoken. Uh, so now I'll, I'll pass over to Alex. Um, Alexandra Arce von Herald is from Costa Rica. Uh, she's a youth leader. Uh, she's been involved in the Youth Summit for Nuclear Abolition. She's the coordinator for parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament in Costa Rica, uh, and also a leader in the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and a doctor herself. Alex. Thank you, Alan. Um, so first I want to just uh, explain a little bit, it's so important uh, to engage youth. Um, sorry about that. So it is very important actually. They may not be, I mean youth may not be the ones who are in political power now, but they are the ones who are going to have that political power in the future. So it's very important that uh, we direct them into the right path. We want them to, we want to try to engage them. So when they finally have that power, they are going to go into a correct path. Uh, besides that, they are also very passionate, energetic. They can create a lot of pressure. Uh, in different ways. So there, this passion that youth has is very important and can be used in a good way. I'm not saying that that everybody that is not young, part of youth doesn't have that passion. Of course, I'm, I know a lot of people that have this amount of passion or more. I'm just saying that this is the reason why it's important also to engage youth. So last year, uh, 
30 young people from different nuclear disarmament organizations and from 23 different countries, me included, uh, realized a youth summit in Japan. You know, last year was the 70 year of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing. Uh, so at first, all, only by with with ourselves, we did some workshops together to see where our strengths and weaknesses are, so that we could unite it, collaborate, and be more efficient. After that, there was uh, one day where 250 young people came uh, that did not know a, a lot about nuclear disarmament; that just wanted to get to know about it and maybe. Uh, participate and uh, they were uh, they learned about the importance of nuclear disarmament heard speech, speeches from Hibakushas, from UN representatives from a lot of very important personalities so that they could uh, have this already in their mind for the afternoon session where each of us of the 30 of us had a group of 8 to 10 people uh, and we tried to um, engage them, encourage them into doing specific plans, not just, oh, yeah, let's do, no, specific plans to help out. Another very important thing that we did was uh, that to write a youth pledge, where in one of its points, it has seven points, but in one of its points, it says, call on our elected representatives to adopt national legislation prohibiting and criminalizing the manufacture, investment in testing, deployment, threat or use of nuclear weapons. So obviously we also understand that we, we, we have to educate, we have to share information, we have to try to engage, but we also know the importance of trying to do exactly that but uh, with the people who make the laws in our respective countries. Um, so the Youth Pledge has had a lot of recognition. It has been presented in many important nuclear disarmament events, like at the UN General Assembly First Committee, and also at the Permanent Mission of Japan in New York, and is right now semifinalist, semifinalist of the Hero Award by Billions Awards. And now I will just talk a little bit about uh, what I have done with parliamentarians and how I do it. Maybe it could help out. Um, so I ha my work with parliamentarians has been very successful. There is only one thing that everybody should know and remember, and that is that they only give you like five minutes of their time. So if you try to engage a parliamentarian, normally you would have to be very quick, very fast, very concrete, straight to the point, and you you have to immediately, like almost immediately from the start, uh, let the parliamentarian or congressperson know what exactly you want from them. Um, so that's how I, I'll explain how we did it. So, out of for in Costa Rica, we only have 57 Congress people. So, out of those 57 Congress people. Uh, 50 signed a PNND petition to eliminate nuclear weapons. And I couldn't have done that with, uh, without my, our PNND co-president, Natalia Diaz-Quintana. She's a congresswoman here, uh, who has been, uh, who worked with me as a, as a team. She would approach two or three parliamentarians and then send them to me. I would give very fast information and then ask them to sign. And that's, you know, that's how we worked that out. And also, um, we have had a lot of communication between each other. I have more mem more PNND members, but she is really the one that has been more active. And, oh, by the way, um, she is uh, 31 years old. And um, so, okay, so Natalia has been a tremendous help. She has passed motions commemorating different dates. She has engaged in different topics, and well, she is also the president of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Interparliamentary Union. So, in the end, you can you can see how uh, young people can engage parliamentarians, and 
we have to do it really quickly and very strategically, but it's absolutely possible. And then if you work with them as a team, uh, everything could you know be facilitated towards your uh, objective. Um, I have the fortune to have Natalia by my side. And then for the next presidency, I will have to find another equivalent of Natalia. But I see that in each presidency, there is at least one, two, or three, uh, maybe 10 members or 50 members of PNND, but at least all, not all of them are active. So at least one, two, or three are active, and they help out a lot. And this is how normally you can just do it. You can engage not only parliamentarians, you can engage the government. And well, you have the, the youth pledge uh, here at the webinar. So you can read it and see all the points, the seven points. Um, but in general, that's basically what, what, what we are trying to do. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Alex. As you see, we're sort of trying to get a balance in here on the webinar on activities that are happening in Geneva, in the deliberations themselves, and activities that are happening around the world that can give support to the initiatives for nuclear disarmament, that can give support to the diplomats who are wanting to make a difference and are struggling against those who are holding back. And that's where this combination of actions is very important. This is what's going to, in a sense, be happening over the next couple of weeks, uh, from May the 2nd to May the 13th in Geneva. That's the May sessions of the Open Ended Working Group. There will be a number of non-governmental people there, a range of different expertise, grassroots activists, academics, mayors, parliamentarians, uh, and, and others. Uh, but more important, or just as important, is what people are going to be doing back in their own towns, cities, capitals around the world, and also what they're going to be doing online on social media in order to highlight the Open Ended Working Group, in order to encourage their government to give this the serious consideration that it deserves, and to put a lot of effort into making sure it works. Uh, so that's where there's a combination of initiatives and activities, and that combination is very important. You know, if it's just one activity, it probably wouldn't do much, but that combination is important. And of course, Unfold Zero is a platform, but we're not the only platform. There are others as well. And part of what we'll be doing in Geneva is also working on cooperation between the different non-governmental or civil society initiatives. Okay, that's a bit of an introduction to the Open Ended Working Group, to a few of the activities. Uh, we have a chance now to open up to questions. What we might do, uh, just as the questions are coming in, you can either type the questions in, and I see we've got a couple, um, or you can raise your hand and we can ask you to answer the question. But just before we start on the first question, uh, we'd like to do the first of our polls. That's just to get a little bit of feedback. Um, this is helpful to us, but it may also be helpful to you. Uh, so what we'll do, when we do the poll, the poll will come on screen, which means you won't see us. Uh, if you quickly you'd fill in your response, and then when it's finished, we'll close the poll, announce the results, and, and then go on to the questions. Um, so here's the first poll. Oh, votes are coming in quite quickly. Over half of you have already voted. Okay. Well, we'll I think we'll close. Oh, I've got a couple more votes coming in. Okay. Um, so far, we've seen from the poll uh, that. Everyone has basically said their government hasn't done a good job of advising the public in the country about the Open Ended Working Group. We figured that might be the case. Um, so that's something which we'll feed back to the governments uh, in Geneva when we talk to them, that uh, if they were you know, wanting to have some uh, political support for disarmament, it's very important for them to work with civil society to publicise the importance of implementing, for example, the recommendations from the UN study 
on disarmament and non-proliferation education in order to uh, to encourage greater public awareness. Okay, I'm about to close the poll now. Um, um, that's not what I want to do. And you should be able to see us back on screen. Okay, I'm now going to look at the questions. Uh, we have a question for Mark for no. Uh, and this is, Mark, do you see any future for the humanitarian movement? Um, the questioner, I just can't see who this is, um, is asking, oh, it's Elena Mahukova, is asking, um, as a coalition of governments, or governments pick this up, um, and what might they do through the open ended working group to take the humanitarian initiative forward? Yes, well, in my view, this movement, uh, this process that was started already uh, two years ago, three years ago, and uh, will not stop. It will not disappear. On the contrary, it, it is it's bound to 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 be enlarged to to get uh, wider support because it's a very uh, not only logical and sensible argument but it's also based on a concept of security which is you know not dealing only with the security of states or governments or armies uh, but also uh, but uh, of people human security so this appeals to every human being potentially uh, and and now we have a history of arms control disarmament agreements that have been adopted based on this motivation, on this criterion to preserve uh, victims. Now, even in the last uh, treaty that was concluded, uh, the arms trade treaty, there's a reference to human suffering which is quite unprecedented in a you know, trade treaty but it's also an arms control treaty. So. I believe uh, this momentum will not stop. Of course, there is still, a, on the part of some governments, uh, a tendency to deny this movement. To, uh, to, um, sorry about this. Uh, uh, to uh, abstain from reacting to it. Uh, to refuse the dialogue, as we can see at the open-ended working group. But obviously, there will be uh, more and more actions based on on this uh, uh, momentum. Now, uh, whether this will be enough to convince the reluctant countries, of course, it's difficult to say. Uh, it certainly needs more um, visibility, more um, uh, support in societies, and especially. Of course, we are lucky in democratic countries where, as Alex mentioned, you know, parliament, parliamentarians uh, are elected and they can be, uh, you can talk to them and, and they can take into account the point of view of the voters because their future political situation depends on, on what the voters decide. But in other countries well, where there is not such a democratic system, now we have a way to reach out to people through the, uh, uh, the new technologies, the social media, and uh, we have examples of this. Uh, you know, during the uh, the negotiations on the Iranian nuclear program, where there was uh, in some countries um, a very negative attitude towards Iran, even talked about military strikes. There were people from Israel and Iran that. Uh, uh, you know, got together and, and on Facebook, on, on Twitter, exchanged views and said we're, we're not enemies, uh, we should, uh, you know, maintain peace and avoid this kind of military action. So, uh, this is a way now to reach out to uh, more people than just through the, the traditional channels. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you for mentioning the importance of a combination of using the social media and diplomacy. The combination of them can help work together. Uh, and later on, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Let's Talk Nuke social media platform, which we've just launched, which seems to be doing quite well. 
but in the meantime, I see that Jean-Marie Collin has raised his hand to speak. So I'm just unmuting you now, Jean-Marie, and if you also unmute yourself, uh, I invite you to ask a question. Jean-Marie. Yes, thank you, Alan. Um, well, thank you for this really interesting webinar and for the speech of your two experts. I have a question to, to Mark, um, as he was a former French diplomat and as I am a, an expert for in France. What he thinks about the fact that France and other nuclear weapons states don't want to participate to the opening and the working, working group and what could be the impact of this decision for the next NPT prep conversation? Well, if you want my advice, my opinion, I, I can be very blunt. I think that the nuclear weapon states are used to the concept of fear. And, you know, because nuclear weapons are based on fear, the fear of others' uh, aggression or uh, attacks, and the, the fear that uh, is intended to uh, inflict on other people's uh, uh, through nuclear weapons. So, you know, that's the basis of their security policy. So it's not a surprise that they're afraid of dialogue. Uh, it, of course, it's, it's much comfortable, uh, much more comfortable for them when they are in the, in the conference on disarmament, where they read the speech, you know, which is a repetition of the well-known positions. There's hardly any ever any response. And in any case, for any decision, they have a right to veto, like in the, in the uh, Security Council. So uh, that's a very comfortable position. Now, when they are in a framework when there is free dialogue, especially also including civil society, when there is a risk for them of uh, taking a decision by majority where they will be isolated, of course they are afraid and that's why they try to stay out. Uh, so uh, again, you know, this, this, this can be regretted, but this can be exposed. And uh, I know when I talk to my, my former diplomats, uh, diplomatic colleagues that personally they, they are not very comfortable. Um, they just have to apply their uh, instructions, but I'm sure some would prefer to, to have a dialogue because if they are conv convinced that they are right, they shouldn't be afraid to argue. Uh, but apparently, they are not very confident in the solidity of their arguments. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. There's a question here from Daniel Smith, which seems to follow on from this, because you mentioned that the hesitation of countries like France in participating in the dialogue is that they still have fears, they have security concerns, and so they're not ready to negotiate on nuclear disarmament. Daniel Smith addresses this in his question by saying, uh, would we be supportive of the proposal by William Ure in his book, Beyond the Hotline, and his proposal was to establish crisis control centres in order to be able to address crises before they escalate into a risk of a nuclear exchange. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask Ed Mark a few We've got like a response to this idea from Daniel, or coming from William Urai, um, on the crisis reduction, crisis management as being related to the issue of negotiating nuclear disarmament. Of course, there are uh, very effective means of uh, avoiding a uh, form of es escalation or, or crisis, and and you remember that it was the uh, missile crisis, uh, the Cuban missile crisis. And the early 60s, that led to the, the first uh, hotlines and uh, direct communication between the, the two uh, nuclear superpowers uh, at that time. And this was imitated by most nuclear powers. Uh, but as we know, this is not enough. Uh, despite the existing structures, we have seen some examples of uh, almost unauthorized uh, uh, use of nuclear weapons or near misses or um, uh, lack of control. So uh, this is not enough. Uh, the risk of use of nuclear weapons will disappear only when nuclear weapons disappear. 
in the meantime, obviously, it's it's better to have this kind of system of communication, so of crisis, uh, crisis management. Uh, but at the same time, when you have so many weapons that are on so-called hair trigger alert, the risk is still very high that uh, uh, there would be uh, this kind of use of, of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Mark. And just a quick follow-up question on this, and I've got a couple of other questioners waiting, but I think the question goes beyond just nuclear crises, but also security, that if governments are still relying on nuclear weapons and deterrence for security, is there ways to eliminate that through more cooperative security mechanisms? And I ask that not only of you, but also Alex, because in Latin America, it was the you know first region to give up nuclear weapons and reliance on nuclear weapons and establish a regional nuclear weapon free zone. And as part of that reason is because countries can find their security through other means than military, through using the courts, through using diplomacy. Is that part of what will help us get to a nuclear weapons free world? So firstly Mark and then Alex on that question. Yes, certainly it's, it's of course a very broad question uh, because you cannot uh, address nuclear weapons in a vacuum. They are part of security system and as, as you remember the intention of the founders of the United Nations was to put into place a collective security system and the Security Council was one element and there, there were uh, int intentions to first uh, prioritize the, the principle of non-use of force to give a role of for the UN to uh, to use military force in case of uh, a conflict um, and, and, and also for the Security Council to uh, play a role in regulating armaments. Of course when the Charter was adopted there was only one nuclear power and uh, the other members of the Security Council uh, yeah, had their status but without nuclear weapons. Now, of course, the, there was this tendency to as associate the status of permanent member of the Security Council with possession of nuclear weapons and that created, in a sense, an incentive for new countries to want to reach up to this status. This is what uh, India did and uh, other countries that uh, sought the, the same power uh, conferred by the uh, Security Council uh, by possessing nuclear weapons. So clearly there is a need to break this linkage and to uh, put into place a system that would uh, make nuclear weapons uh, irrelevant, useless, and uh, this is basically the, what the Security Council has uh, adopted, adopted as a principle uh, in many resolutions, the, and the most important one being Resolution uh, 1887 uh, of 2009 at the level of heads of states of government, where all states of the Security Council, including the permanent five agreed to create the conditions for a world without nuclear weapons. Now, of course, you can argue about the meaning of this phrase, but there is a clear uh, commitment to a world without nuclear weapons. Thank you, Mark. And now, Alex, is Latin America a good model for being able to give up nuclear weapons? Yes, um, it was not uh, easy um, at the beginning, especially if you think, take into account, for example, Cuba um, and the USSR. But uh, it began uh, like uh, Costa Rica and Malaysia gave uh, a proposal of a convention to prohibit nuclear weapons. And then more and more countries began to join. And after the USSR was no longer there, uh, Cuba also joined. So as soon as uh, all the, the countries of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean joined, uh, we became a, the most densely populated nuclear weapons-free zone. 
And well, at the same time, I have to maybe mention that uh, Costa Rica doesn't have an army. So even I don't even if you try to explain to people because uh, we have we have gone we have taken videos and everything um, to people on the street, uh, policemen, all types of people, and we have asked them how many nuclear weapons do you think there are, and they um, nobody knew. But uh, then the next question was, uh, so how many nuclear weapons should there be? And everybody, that was for me surprising, because everybody just made a face like, hmm? Like, I don't even understand your question. Everybody was like, zero. <laughs> Immediate answer, zero. Even a policeman said, the, that was maybe, the policeman said, zero, because maybe that way we'll, we'll, end, we'll have finally some peace. So, you know, uh, growing up in a country that doesn't have an army maybe has some influence into our way of thinking. And um, basically, when people ask us, for, for example, how do you protect your borders, we don't understand the, those kind of questions. So we, we just, we don't want to be under any umbrella, any nuclear umbrella. We don't want to be part of anything that has to do with that. And that goes for all Latin America and the Caribbean now. We are all in the same page with that. And we just don't, don't want anyone to make that kind of alliance with us. So, and well, Latin America has had a history with the U.S that um, may also be part of why they don't want to be under their umbrella. But um, in general, this is how it happened. And now we are the, you know, just, yes, the most densely populated nuclear weapons free zone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, there are questions here from Jeffrey Danton and Rosalind Cook, which if you don't mind, I'll answer very quickly. And then I have Vidya Shankar has got his hand raised to ask a question. Uh, Rosalind Cook asks if the Marshall Islands case at The Hague, this is the one that lodged against the nuclear armed states and it's running with respect to India, Pakistan and the UK. Uh, Rosalind's asked um, whether this could help bring leverage to the UK to participate in the open-ended working group. Uh, a quick response to this is I think it's very important uh, to use this case to put, uh, encourage the UK to participate in the open-ended working group. The wonderful campaigning work that's been done in the UK with the big march that CND organised recently, for example, and the questions asked by the parliamentarians like Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party and a Kennedy Council member. But I think this, the court case has actually had some impact on the UK. And the impact is that the UK, uh, not that they've joined the Open Ended Working Group, but they've made a proposal to the Conference on Disarmament that the Conference on Disarmament Adopt a Work Program that is pretty much the same as what the Open Ended Working Group is considering the legal measures and norms to achieve and maintain a nuclear weapons free world. So I think it's pushed the UK into at least putting forward this proposal to the Conference on Disarmament. It's not go going anywhere at the moment in the Conference on Disarmament because there's still the veto power of any one state, there are other complications. Uh, but I think it's had some impact. But not enough to get the UK to the Open Ended Working Group yet. Uh, quickly, the question from Jeffrey Danton, um, which is, can we get across to leaders and decision makers of nuclear powers that individuals involved in the acquisition and deployment of nuclear weapons are taking on individual personal liability for crimes against peace? I think this is a very important question, because I think in terms of building a peaceful world, we can't have leaders hiding behind the states. This is exactly what the Nuremberg trials were about, to say that individuals have a responsibility for their actions, even if it's actions on behalf of a state. Uh, in the open-ended working group, this aspect is not really being discussed, but it is being discussed elsewhere. And that is that Mexico has put a proposal uh, to the uh, International Criminal Court. There's a review of the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute, and Mexico has put forward a 
proposal that the employment of nuclear weapons uh, would be a crime that would come under the jurisdiction of the ICC. Uh, and so this is an, and Mexico has asked other countries to support them in getting this adopted as an amendment or an additional protocol. Um, also at the national level, there are some countries which have adopted quite strong legislation on individual responsibility. In my country, New Zealand, is one of those. So it's a crime for anyone in New Zealand or any New Zealand official anywhere in the world to be involved in the threat or use of nuclear weapons or planning and preparation for their use. I'll now go to Vidya Shankar, who's raised his hand. And uh, Vidya, if you, uh, I think you can answer with one picture. Vidya, from India. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I think this is an excellent idea, and I'm very happy to be part of this dialogue. Uh, I joined the discussion just, I think, as Mark had started speaking. So I perhaps missed out his initial questions, and I wasn't sure whether you can hear me at all, so I started typing out my question. But my, my concern is just this one. I read the chair's synthesis paper. Although it, it, the title is synthesis, I didn't see any synthesis come out. I saw what, what could easily be called a summary of various positions. So he certainly seems to have put together the various positions that uh, working was suggested to the chair. I wonder if you agree with this idea. The second is, um, have any states, to your knowledge, uh, got together or expressed a desire to get together to negotiate a ban at all? Because if that is going to be a push of some civil society organizations, such as the ICANN and so on, do you know of any states actually willing to, uh, you know, uh, the test of the pudding is in the eating, they're willing to step forward, bite the bullet. And if that is not to happen, or we're not aware of really there. The final question is, what would be a reasonable expectation from this open-ended work then? Anyone can take the question on. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. I'll pass to Mark first, and you asked, but I may also offer a comment on this. Mark? Yes, thank you. Good question. Uh, of course, you know, we, we shouldn't really blame it on, on the chairman because he's, he's really uh, doing a good work of trying to precisely uh, recognize all the statements and, and, and summarize them in a paper. Obviously, as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, it would be naive to expect, uh, uh, you know, in the end, uh, consensus language on such sensitive issues which haven't led to consensus previously. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he's doing a, a fa fairly good job of uh, at least identifying the, the positions. Then what is being done with with this kind of paper will be in the hands of, of, of course, the member states and the General Assembly later. But uh, if you read some of the working papers, uh, if you listen to some of the statements, it seems that at least there are a couple of countries that are determined uh, not to let things uh, fall into oblivion and 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 you know keep the momentum. So I have in mind countries like uh, Brazil or Mexico or Austria or South Africa. Um, now there may be uh, not full agreement among them, you know, on how to go about it, what kind of process to start, but at least there are, there is some determination not to be content with the status quo. And you, as you know, diplomats and states like frameworks, like uh, deadlines, and, and there is one, there are a couple of important deadlines in the, in the coming years. One, of course, is the 2020 NPT review conference, which sort of hangs in the air because there will be a preparatory process, several meetings before that. And also the 2018 um, summit meeting or a high level meeting on nuclear disarmament, which has been agreed upon by the General Assembly. And of course, not unanimously, but at least uh, it is, uh, it has been adopted by a majority, so it, it has to take place. So some member states think that this could exert some pressure and uh, could encourage some of them to launch a process within the UN or outside the UN.
thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, I'll offer a uh, follow-up comment. Can can you hear me there? Yes. Am I? Oh, good. Um, just one thing about what the chair is trying to do, and you can actually find out a little bit more about uh, his approach uh, by looking at uh, the Basel Peace Office uh, summary of a roundtable we just had with the chair and about 22 governments, including the range of governments. What the chair has mentioned, and he also mentioned this when he presented his synthesis paper, was that in looking at the different proposals, what he saw was that there's a lot of commonality on the different elements that would be required to get to a nuclear weapons free world. Where there were big differences was the timing or the sequencing, with some countries arguing that you need to take disarmament steps first and then have prohibition at the end. So it's more sort of like a technical, that's more like the progressive or building blocks or step-by-step -step approach and once you've got lower numbers, control of the materials, control of the technology, then you can go through prohibition. The other approach is to put prohibition up near the front and say the way we're going to get to disarmament is actually to, to delegitimize and prohibit the weapons and then the technical side, the, fate, the elimination will come much easier. So there's a difference of opinion there. What the chair has said is that maybe there's a way of if we look at the elements and not put them either one or the other approach but have a more of a flexible package, something like a framework agreement it might be able to bring in a lot more uh, uh, synthesis of these different uh, approaches. Um, and that's been of interest to the, to the delegates. There has been some discussion when you put this forward, oh, so where would this fit in a, in a framework agreement? Uh, where would a ban treaty fit? Could it fit? Um, and I think it's, it's got some of the delegations asking questions about how to do it, rather than just putting forward their proposal as you know, the only one. It hasn't succeeded totally yet. There's still you know, people stuck somewhat to some of their proposals, but I think he's provided a, a, a way to be able to discuss it and maybe come to some uh, synthesis on that. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions from Elena. Um, I think we've probably got time for one of your questions, Elena. So I was wondering if I debut you uh, and you can ask either your question about Tariq Rolf's proposal or the one on de-alerting. Uh, Elena, are you there? Elena? Okay, we don't hear you, so what I'll do is I'll ask Mark the one on de-alerting then, because that's a specific question you had. Um, Mark, the question was, do you think that de-alerting would be a useful measure um, and do you think that it's possible that the nuclear weapon states uh, might make a, uh, a step on de-alerting, uh, even though they're not participating in the open-ended working group? Of course, this is a, um, a very sensitive question because uh, usually nuclear weapon states don't like or don't want to discuss this they say for security reasons and any uh, agreement that could ever occur between nuclear weapon states will, will probably be negotiated in, in secrecy. The main, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical evidence that reducing the, the degree of uh, alert uh, reduces the risk of unauthorized use or um, uh, the risk of use of nuclear weapons in general. However, there is a major flaw, is that this is a technical measure that is difficult to verify, so what nuclear weapon states really would need to have a higher degree of confidence uh, in the others to believe that uh, the, the other states have uh, actually de-alerted their own nuclear weapons. And uh, the other flaw is that it, it can be reversed very quickly and very easily. So um, the, if you take the example of the chemical weapons, for instance, uh, you know, within the, the framework of the Chemical Weapons Convention, there's an agreement to, to ban the weapons, and those states that possess the weapons have agreed to make the use of these weapons impossible. They have 
this, uh, you know, neutralized them or dismantled some key elements even before the actual elimination of the weapons. Uh, this, this is what was done most recently in the case of uh, the Syrian uh, chemical weapons. So, you know, a similar system could be envisaged, but that would certainly require, um, uh, you know, an, an advanced uh, form of agreement or negotiation between the nuclear weapon states so that they agree to withdraw their actual uh, warheads from uh, the launchers, the missiles, the submarines, or, you know, ensure that uh, nuclear weapons could not be used, as, you know, in a very short uh, time frame, even if they retain the weapons for some time. Thank you very much, Mark. We're coming to the uh, near the end of the webinar. Uh, I just have oh, one more hand that's been raised. I was just trying to see who that is. Uh, oh, is it Jean Marie has raised his hand again? I think. Just a minute. I'll just click on you, Jean Marie. Was that correct, Jean Marie? No, but I. Oh. Oh. You heard me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my my. So my second question is for Alex. Did she see some difference between the thinking uh, on, of the thinking about nuclear deterrence between the the young uh, that she 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 met uh, all over the world? I mean, did she see a real difference how the the young people understand how it's important or if they are very scary about the nuclear bomb? Um, uh, is this uh, with the people that I met all around the world? Yeah. Me, or just people I've met? in Japan, for example. No, no, in people Japan, you met people in different... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, everybody... It's difficult to explain because the nuclear bomb is everywhere, all the time. You see it mentioned in movies, in TV shows, uh, People just say randomly, just nuke them all the time. So the nuclear bomb is there all the time in everybody's mind. But for some reason, people just normalize it. This happens when normalization happens when something that is very threatening uh, is there, uh, it's going to be there, and you cannot do anything about it. That's what. That's how people just normalize any kind of aggression, including being um, terrorized by nuclear weapons, which uh, is the way I would say it. Um, so people understand that nuclear weapons are a risk, but at the same time, because they normalize it, they don't put it inside their heads in their daily, daily things. They just uh, go around their life. And they pay more attention, for example, to climate change, even though both things are completely related and both things are extremely important, not just one over the other. So all the people I met in Japan when we were in the summit, for example, well, of the 30 activists that were there, we obviously know the, the, the dangers and how important it is to try to do our best to get a nuclear weapons free world. But the people, the 250 people that arrived at the summit and who didn't know much, uh, they were so astounded when they heard um, different experts talking about it, when they saw a, a film that was done by one of the Hibakushas and then hearing the Hibakusha speaking. Uh, it was like they began, the, they were at the, in the morning, they came like, normal people who had no worries in their minds and then as soon as they began to hear all all of what the experts had to say and the hibakushas they became terrorized as they should be so after that when we were doing uh, when we were already uh, making the workshop and I had a group of eight people with me and all of us had a group of like eight to ten people all of them were very excited to try to work 
on this and to try to make anything that would help out to this cause. So they normally people don't put it inside their heads, they just normalize it. And then when you actually demonstrate how how dangerous and how present the danger is, because it's not something in the future, it's right now. And they begin to understand and then they get scared. So yes, I would say that they got scared. And then they wanted to try to do something about it. And they were very motivated. So basically I think that would be my answer from what I observed. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we're coming to an end now of the webinar. We've just gone slightly over time. Uh, so. I want to wrap up now and thank uh, Mark Fano and Alexandra Asif von Herald for participating and giving us very uh, different backgrounds but very important contributions to discussions over nuclear disarmament and input into the deliberation process in Geneva on the Open Ended Working Group. I want to thank you all for participating. The dialogue doesn't end here. Uh, we keep talking. We can talk through social media on Let's Talk Nukes. Um, on there you can post questions or comments to your governments uh, and uh, we will be meeting with the diplomats in Geneva. We'll take some of your questions that we see on uh, online and ask them those questions and post answers. Uh, there are other forms of dialogue which we're doing, uh, enabling through the Unfold Zero platforms. Uh, we hope that you continue to participate. Uh, and that we look forward to ensuring that there is uh, more buzz on this issue, whether it be buzz in Geneva or buzz around around the world. Uh, so again, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. We look forward to keep, keep being uh, in contact with you, and we will be doing more webinars in the future. We'll let you know the topics and invite you to participate in those as well. Uh, again, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.